How are you this afternoon? Good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> good. Excited. You ready for another one? <laughs> Amen. Well, um, that's good, amen. So I was scooting around at a couple of the, uh, the discussions afterwards, and uh, I was very happy to see that um, people were blessed by that last session, and so we're going to just explore it out a little bit more. So. I'll give a bit of an update. Can we have that PowerPoint values, um, layers of life? So I did, I did this last night. So if we can just click through that. Be, I've got my clicker here. All right. Last night I turned it off. Do that now. Okay. Uh, can we go to the one where it's just the, the triangle? That one. There we go. Bring him back. Resurrect. <laughs> Alright, so this is the layers of life and I, I said that pretty much everybody lives out of a revelation of what, what they believe about God determines how they live. So what you believe about God defines your principles and then from your principles you define your values and then from your values you define your priorities and your practices. So what you believe about God is really important because it defines the whole way you live, right? We talked about this on Friday night. So going on to the next, uh, oh, hang on, I can do this. There we go, there's five things there. Another way of doing this is if you look at the layers of life, um, you can drill down the other way, and you know everything stems out of what you believe about God. But if you look at your practices, what you do, that will give you an indication of what your customs are, or what your practices are, which will lead to your priorities. So what you're doing is what you're prioritizing your life. The priorities lead to your precedents or your values, which is your convictions. And uh, it's out of convictions that we want to operate because a value, a priority becomes automatic when it's a value in your life. So if you really believe in going to church, without thinking you make it a, a priority in your life because it's a value, it's a conviction that you have. And so out of your values comes your principles, which is something based on truth, what you believe to be true. and um, then what you, uh, uh, truth comes from revelation. Amen? And so as we can, we can go one way, we can drill down, look at what we do, and that will give us an idea of what we believe, or we can look at what we believe and start to develop what we should do. Amen? So I went through and I explained all the different religions this morning in the world and why they do certain things. It's because of what they believe. And what you believe about God and what you believe about yourself is so important because it develops how you live your life. Amen? So, I talked a lot this morning about how most Christians believe that they've still got a bit of sin in them. Okay? That's what most Christians believe. And so they've got a bit of sin in them. And so when they sin, they say, oh, that's because I've got sin in me. But we went at great lengths this morning to show you that sin no longer has any part to it or any power over you. The, the dominion of sin has been broken through the power and work of Jesus Christ. And so you are completely a new creation in Christ, a new nature, and sin is now <coughs> excuse me, external to you and uh, trying to you know, tempt you and things, but you don't have to bow to it because you no longer have this sin nature. And then we went through and talked through this a little bit. We said, if you believe you have a sin nature, then you'll always go through this cycle. You go, you do something wrong, you go into guilt, shame, think it's, oh, it's just part of me, I'm not really as good as I thought I was or as other people think I am. And you go in this process of trying to do a recompense or what the Catholics would call penance and you do all this for a little while, then you go back into this, you get better for a little while, then you go wrong again and round around you go in this cycle. Not healthy, okay? Then we go to session two, thanks, so that'd be good. So we wanted to break that cycle. We wanted to live in freedom and live in health. And so the way we do that is to come back and understand that sin no longer has part of us. Phew! That was the whole sermon in five minutes. <laughs> I should have started that this morning, eh? We could have played cricket a bit longer or something, right? Uh, so that was it uh, in summary. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Yeah. Any questions before I go on on that? 
All good? Clear? Okay. Well, we're going to expand this uh, out a little bit more. There goes sin, and there goes the guilt shame cycle. All done with. We're now no longer bound by that. Hallelujah. Amen. So, if we look at 2 Peter 1 verse 4, it says that we are now partakers of divine nature. We have God's nature in us, and that's what we belong partake of. And 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. We know these scriptures, amen? amen. Do I get an amen? amen? Amen. Even from conservative people. That's great. <laughs> amen from conservative people. Heard that in one of the groups, it's a bit of a joke. Um, so, um, let's look at this a little bit further. Then why do we believe that we still have sin in us? Where did that teaching come from? Well, it wasn't in the early church fathers. If you read the early uh, Catholic writings, Thomas Aquinas and people like that, third century, um, if you read their writings, they quite clearly say that when you uh, become a Christian, your nature is changed, and when you do, uh, when you um, sin, you're making a mistake. But sin doesn't define you, because you no longer belong to sin. Okay, that's a Catholic thing. But it went off a little bit. And it got uh, down to buying your salvation, doing, going, doing works, trying to earn your salvation. We went through that a little bit. And then we get to uh, the 16th century, and we entered in uh, Calvinism. And Calvinism introduced this idea of progressive sanctification. Everybody say that. Progressive, progressive sanctification. Whoa, that's a big word, eh? More than three syllables. Mate, it's confusing me already. So progressive sanctification says... You have sin, past. Why do I know this so well? I used to teach it. Okay. Sin, present. Present. Stupid pen can't spell. Sin, future. Okay, so it says <coughs> you've, been, you've been saved from your past sins, but you've still got sin. You're a work in progress. Right? hand and so this is what's happening at the moment you're becoming more christ-like who's heard that before doesn't it say that we are now partakers of christ we have god's nature in us that sin has been completely done away with the old has passed the life that we used to live is dead the life we now live is in christ we just forget all that and we just introduce this new idea <laughs> that we still got sin in us right? and then um you know eventually when we get to heaven all the sin will go away from us. Who's heard that before? This is called progressive sanctification. Let me draw it another way. This is wrong teaching, by the way. I'm showing what I don't believe. And we, we understand that. So just listen to this for the next five minutes, then completely forget everything I've said, <laughs> and listen to that after that, because that's what I want you to remember. All right? Okay, so we've got spirit, and we've got soul, and we've got body. Who's seen this before? Yeah. This is the three parts of man. And the body is made up of what? Five senses. Okay? You know what they are? Touch, smell, hearing, whatever. The soul is made up of three parts. Mind, will, and emotions. And the spirit is made up of also three parts. Intuition, two, moral conscience, and three, connection with God. Right. Now surprising to us, when you are not a Christian, do you know what? You've still got a spirit. And when it says your spirit is dead, what it means is that it's just dead to God. But you still have a spirit. That's why New Age people, you know the New Age stuff that they do? Is it true or is it not true? What do you think? Well, it's true. Because they're operating in the spirit realm, they're just not operating by God's spirit. Right? If you've been into the third world countries that I've been into, and seen some of the stuff that goes on, I'm telling you the spirit man is alive. When they do voodoo dolls and stuff like that in Africa, and they send curses on people, and they by, by curses they manipulate other people. 
This is very real, but it's operating in the spirit realm, but just not godly spirit. Okay? So, um, do we have that other pen, dude? Color. So, progressive sanctification says this. When you get saved, your spirit is saved. So we'll give a tick for the spirit. But on the spirit, get saved. <laughs> spirit saved. Tick. But the soul, not quite saved. Right? Still got a bit of sin in it. And mostly saved. Right? But you're becoming more like Christ. <laughs> okay? You're trying to get sin out of you. And so I believe that this is and then it believes that this is totally not saved, and that's why we have to have a resurrected body. That's progressive sanctification. Okay? Who's seen that before? Who's thought that before? I've certainly thought I used to teach it. Right? Certainly thought it. And I used to think that we've got to die to self. We've got to die to this. We've got to put it under us. And by the act of our will, we've got to get that sin out of us. And we've got to discipline ourselves so that we become more Christ-like. That's what I used to teach. <laughs> now, who knows? That's law. That's legalism. It's actually trying to force Christianity by law, by the will. And you must do this, and you must do that. And oh, if you sin, you've got to try and um, discipline yourself. And it doesn't bring life. It brings judgment. Because the harder you try, what happens? Sometimes you fall. And when you fall, what happens then? You go into that good old grief cycle, and that good old <coughs> cycle, and you start to you know, mess up and things like that. Who's with me so far? Okay. Who wants to get out of this? Who wants freedom? Are we with, are we with that? We want to go with freedom? I think it's much better. So that's progressive sanctification. But let's look at some scriptures to see if this progressive sanctification idea stacks up. <coughs> so let's start off with um, Romans 12. Verse 1. Get back a little bit. Oh, next, next slide, thanks. Romans 12, verse 1. Good. So I beseech you, uh, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, what is your body? Holy and acceptable to God. Which is your spiritual worship. Do not therefore be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently about yourself. Right? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is the good and accept what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are transformed by thinking differently. Amen? Let's go a little bit further. When we look at what sin, when we look at ourselves and how sin affects us, let's look at Psalm 103, verse 12. What does it say? As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you understand that scripture? If you go north to south, if you're going up, you're going north, then you get to the top of the world and you start going south. And then if you go to the bottom of the world, then you start going north again. And you're oscillating between north and south, right? But if you go east, and you're going east, you keep on going east. There's no end to east. Or if you go the other way, you go west, there's no end to west. And so as far as the east is from the west, meaning as far as infinity is this way, and as far as infinity is that way, is how far sin has been removed from it. Is that good? Yes. Who's happy about that? Some people are happy. Right. <laughs> Isaiah 44, verse 22. It says this. I've blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I've redeemed you. Sin has been blotted out. Amen? Look at Colossians 1, verse 13. He has delivered us 
from the dominion of darkness and transferred. We no longer live in the dominion of darkness. We now live in the kingdom of the light. We now live in the kingdom of his beloved son. Ephesians 5 verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you're in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We no longer live in that realm of sin anymore. So, this is the good news. Romans 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ, and you are free from the law of sin and death. Sin no longer has any power over you. Let's look at our current standing. Romans 5, verses 8 to 19. Therefore, as one man trespasses, led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, who is that, the first Adam, that many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, who is that, Jesus Christ, Many will be made righteous. What is your standing if you are a Christian before God? You are no longer a sinner. You are now righteous. Sin does not dwell in you. Can I just emphasize that point? Amen. We are no longer, that's why I don't like that saying, we are sinners saved by grace. I really don't like that saying. Who's, no, you were a sinner. You're now a saint saved by grace. Amen. You have been completely set free. Sin no longer has any part in you. Praise the Lord. And so 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says this, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might become what? Righteousness. The righteousness of God. Well, if we believe that sin is still in us, In this weird theology of this idea, we've got a bit of God in us, co-living co with sin. Who knows that God can't live with sin? Who knows that God can't cohabit with sin? Sin is not part of God's realm. And so if, if you've invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, sin has to be done away with, done away with, sin has to be dealt with, and you take on new nature. You take on, you become a partaker of divine nature. You take on the nature of God. Amen? Are you convinced? Yep. <laughs> well, just in case you're not, we'll just look at some more scriptures. <laughs> Amen? Let's look at Philippians 3 verse 9. Having been found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, so not, come, not a righteousness that's derived from doing good works, but which comes through faith, so I do have righteousness, just not one that comes from doing good works, a righteousness that depends on faith in Jesus. If Jesus has changed my nature, he's changed my life. Amen? So, that's why it says it's so important in Romans 1, verse 16 to 17. The righteous shall live by faith. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and to the Greek, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, written the righteous shall live by faith. Wow. It does not say, and the sinners who are saved by grace <laughs> shall live by faith. It says the righteous. God calls you righteous in Scripture. You are always righteous. You're never called a sinner once you become a Christian. I like it, that. What's your name again? Tim. Hey, Saint Tim. <laughs> how you going? Hey, Saint Sally, how you doing? All good? We're saints. Amen? We're not sinners. Romans 3, verses 21 to 24 says, again says this, For now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, so not because of good works, apart from um, the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Do you believe? Yes. So you are the manifest righteousness of God. Oh, come on. <laughs> How can you sit there and just say, oh, that's, like, that's cool? That's awesome. That's amazing. God has completely changed my nature. 
He's taken sin away. Sin no longer has dominion over me. Sin no longer has power over me. I no longer have to bow to the power of sin. Woo! Yes. Man, I almost yeah. want to go back to that Ted Crusade in Alabama. Yeah! That's what I would say to that. Amen? This is awesome. Okay. I'm getting excited. Sorry about that. All right. So, this is a very confusing scripture that most people point to when you're discussing this topic. And they say, ha-ha, what about Romans 7, verses 15 to 20? So let's read this one out. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, but that is, very, that is good. So now, now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. <laughs> this seems to be opposite to what we are just talking about. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. What? I've just been told that I'm the righteousness of God, that sin no longer dwells in me, that I've been a new creation and everything else, now saying that sin dwells in me. What is that? In my flesh, for I have desired to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not know what is good, uh, for I do not know the good I want, but the evil I do not want, I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, and it's no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. Now who's totally confused now? <laughs> I thought you might be. Alright. And so what I need to explain is the body of scripture. It's called the Romans 7 Bridge. Are you ready? This is Romans 6, which we're read, reading out about, right? And this is Romans 7. This is Romans 8. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> I'm just getting chills just thinking about it. Okay, Romans 8, Romans 7. That scripture that I just read out belongs to this bit here. Okay, let me explain the scriptures. Romans 6 says this. 6. Sin no longer has dominion over you. You've been set free, completely free. Romans 14 says, you know, you're completely free from sin. So that's, that's our state once we become Christians. Romans 5 says, how can we live in sin uh, it may, the grace may abound? Certainly not. For we no longer have any partakers of that. Right? Then it goes into Romans 7. And it talks about if, you've been, if you died with Christ, it's like marrying Christ. It's like a husband and wife that come together. They are now joined. And you cannot be an adultering husband or wife by living with another. So when you died to sin, you were released from the law of marriage to sin, and you've now been put into the law of marriage with Christ. So you can't cohabit with sin and righteousness because that sin belonged to your old husband who died, and now you now have a new husband, which is Christ, and that Christ... You are married to righteousness. That's what that bit, first bit is. That's a nice little summary of Romans, first part of Romans 7. Then it talks about, then it goes into this weird sort of thing. Talking about I do this and I don't want to do and self, sin dwells in me. And what this part is here, this is a type of writing that the Apostle Paul called, uh, Apostle Paul used, called role play. And what he role-played is what it was like to live under the law. So he talks in first person, but he's actually role-playing. And he says, when I lived under the law, this is how I lived. I tried to do the right thing. I understood the law. It was, you know, it, I liked it. But every time I tried to do it, the more I tried to do it, I did what I didn't want to do, and I didn't do what I wanted to do. Oh, wretched man, how can I live like this? Right? It's a role play, you understand that? So most scriptures, most theologians would agree that it's just a role play. Right? And so this is talking about what it's like trying to live Christianity by works or the law. You understand that? Then it clicks back into Romans 8 and says, Wow! Therefore, praise Jesus, 
There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because we no longer live under the law. We've been, sin has been put away with. We no longer have any bondage to the law. We now live free. And if we live in the Spirit, as a Spirit-led believer, we, the, we shall live by the Spirit and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh because now the Spirit of God lives in us. We're no longer bound by that thing and it's all based on the love of God that came and sent His Son to die for us and therefore goes into Romans end part of 8 talking about neither death nor length nor breadth nor nothing can separate us from the love of God because He's completely joined with us in marriage according to Romans 7 and we live with Him forever, free from sin. Hallelujah. Amen. Get excited, clap, do something, holler, do a cartwheel, do something, because this is amazing. Amen. Hallelujah. Whew, isn't that good? And so that scripture, which is often a confusing scripture for people, people often read that scripture, I do what I want to do and I don't do what I'm doing, they say, ha-ha, even the Apostle Paul struggled with sin. But they don't understand, they haven't done proper biblical study, done textual criticism, understand the genre of scripture, what type of scripture it was. And when you understand the genre of scripture, like if you read the King of Solomons, right, it's meant to be like applicable in that culture and it's a type of poetry, right? If I said to my wife, your nose is like the tower of you know, uh, uh, Lebanon and your hair is like a flock of goats, right? It's not a very good, like, good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 she said, then if you say that duck, right? Very, very true, right? It's, it's, a, it's a poetry, right? It's poetry scripture. And so if we make a doctrine out of that, the doctrine of the church, of the long noses and flock of goat hair, right? Because we're not understanding the scripture, then we get it off error. If we don't understand the genre of scripture, we can misinterpret things, right? and apply wrong interpretation. So the genre of scripture for Romans 7, in part, is a role play that demonstrates what it's like not to be like this. It says, this is what it's like to be a Christian. You've been set free from sin. You've been married to Christ. You're no longer that husband of sin has been done with. Romans, this is what it's like not having that in your life. Praise the Lord, there's no condemnation to those who now live in Christ Jesus. Amen? Who's feeling slightly happy about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is what Romans 6 says when it starts off. It says, um, are we there? Yeah. Go to 610. Let's go down one. Yeah, there we are. Could it be any clearer? <coughs> Our old way of life was nailed to the cross. With cross. A decisive end to that sin and miserable life. No longer as sins every back and call. What we believe is this. If we get included in Christ's sin conquering death, we also get included in his life saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal to the end of death as, as the end. Never again will sin have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him, but alive he brings God down to us. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on to every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. <laughs> Just let the revelation of that hit you. This is what Jesus did, past tense. That means you must, you must not give, this is uh, verses 12 to 14, this means you must not give a sin, a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give in to it, the, give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with your old way of life. Throw yourself wholeheartedly and full time. Remember that you've been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can no longer tell you how to live. Or in, a, in the New King James it says, sin no longer has dominion over you. After all, you're now not living under the old tyrant any longer. You are now living in the freedom of God. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Can I prove this anymore? Can I, can I just go in the scripture anymore 
to show you, to prove to you, to, t to show that I'm not off on a fairy land. This is actually scripture. I'm actually teaching something that is absolutely liberating. The clear message from this, if you want to take something home from this weekend, from this camp, is that you no longer have sin in you. You've been completely set free. You now live a new life in Christ Jesus. You now have the power to overcome sin. Amen? Amen. Whilst ever you believe you have sin in you, you can never overcome it. Because you will always justify sin away. But when you have the revelation that you've been completely freed from sin, you now start to believe, hey, I live out of new nature. I don't have to be bowing to that anymore. It no longer has dominion over me. And you're on the first step to seeing recovery. Amen? I'll tell you what's happening in, uh, in Vietnam. What they're doing over there, I was telling some people, one of the groups, what they're doing over there, you can't do in Australia because this been, um, doesn't sort of like have the same laws as Australia. Right? So what they do is they go on the streets, this is a ministry, and they capture, kidnap, whatever, drug addicts. And they put them into a compound, a compound with barbed wire that they can't escape. Right? And they start to tell them that we're going to help you, we feed you, look after you. And so they feed them, look after them. And then for two years they teach them this your new identity in Christ. In the last five years, they have seen just on one type of drug, who knows what ice is. Ever heard of ice? Ice is a very terrible drug. In the last five years, they have seen over 1,000 ice addicts completely restored. Now pastors of churches doing things. So powerful is this ministry. When Barack Obama, the president, went to Vietnam just only uh, last year or the year before, very recently. When he went there, they took about Barack Obama to see the minister, who is now hosting Franklin Graham, they took him to see that minister to show off how great Vietnam is. Look at Vietnam. We can save drug addicts. The result, so the Vietnam government got this idea, well, this is what this Christian guy is doing, we'll set up a government institution. And what we'll do is we'll go capture people, we'll put them in this constitution and tell them that they need to get off drugs. After two years, they come out worse. Because there's no life-changing message that you've been set free from it, that you have new identity, you are not a drug addict, this is the message of Jesus Christ. You might have been a drug addict, but when you accept Jesus Christ, you have new na nature. So it does not matter what you've done in the past. You have been completely set free. You have new nature. You have been transformed. You have been changed. You have new nature. You're now a partaker of...